Hello, everybody. Good uh, afternoon. There actually could be no uh, greater contrast between Dr. Chung's talk and my talk. So you're all going to enjoy this. Uh, I am going to talk about, uh, and we did not coordinate this, is it all about me? And I'm going to start, uh, as uh, I often do when I'm trying to think of the answer to everything, um, uh, by thinking about seven-year-olds. Uh, there is nothing more enthusiastic uh, in the world than a bunch of seven-year-olds. And uh, this uh, really enthusiastic fellow here is my son, Oliver. Um, um, Oliver is uh, obsessed with soccer, and uh, he's in particular obsessed with this guy here, Mario Balotelli. And uh, Balotelli is a goal scorer, and he is as well known for his goal scoring as he is known for his exuberant self-regard. And um, <laughs> he scored here a goal against Manchester United, and he lifted up his shirt to show this other shirt that says, why always me? And uh, now you can all think about why always him, and uh, if you'd close your eyes and think for a second, many of you will think, well, you know, he was born lucky and he's a good player. But there is another answer, which is the subject of my argument, is that the reason it's always him is because he was playing at the time with the best team in the world, probably, which was Manchester City, which is the, the, the winning team in the toughest league in the English Premier Division. It was always him because he had 10 people passing him the ball. And that is what made him uh, the goal scorer. So I'm going to make an argument that if we are interested in predicting why me, we cannot stop at just the individual, and we need to think about context. And that if we're interested in predicting the health of populations, we cannot think only about individuals. Now, why am I starting with this metaphor? I'm starting with this metaphor because biomedicine, what we're all engaged in, has gotten more and more individualistic of late. So in particular, thinking only about the individual is what our friends economists call fundamental attribution error, which is our tendency to ignore context and attribute an individual's success only to their inherent qualities. That Balotelli scores because Balotelli is a genius, right? And Balotelli scores because he's surrounded by 10 geniuses. Now, why is this relevant to us? Well, it's relevant in many ways. I would recommend anybody to spend 45 minutes on Amazon browsing for self-help books about how to make yourself healthier. It's really a lot of fun. My favorite being, you are your own gym, and uh, this gentleman doesn't know me. I am the furthest human being from being my own gym in the face of the planet. Um, and uh, there has been tremendous uh, progress, obviously, in genetics, as Dr. Chung well pointed out. And with this has become the advent of personalized medicine. Now, personalized medicine really is a rubric for health promotion that's based on individual diagnosis and individual prediction for individual health. Of course, corporate interests are not far behind. This from a company, 23andMe, that lets you buy valuable, what is valuable, ancestry information for the price that's cheaper than the price to buy an American girl doll. So we are really moving <laughs> in a direction of that if we understand individual, be it behavior or be it genetics, we can predict. And the notion here is on prediction. We can predict how the individual will do an individual health. Now this idea, as far as I'm concerned, is deeply compelling. This is the definition of compelling. It's interesting. It evokes attention, admiration, it's powerful, irresistible, it inspires conviction. I want to believe it. I want to believe that if I become my own gym, I can improve my own health. And that if I know exactly my genetic code, you can predict my health. The problem is that this thinking confines us to a syllogism. And the syllogism is as follows. Genes are associated with disease. We know that. It is a fact. We can genotype individuals. We know that. It's a fact. Therefore, we can predict disease in individuals. Now, just making an aside since Dr. Chung came before me, everything I'm saying dwells in the world, which is most of the world, of adult health dealing with genotypes with low heritability. Dr. Chung was talking about something different. So actually what I'm saying is not in contrast to what she was saying, although it seems that way from the audience perspective. So I'm actually talking about the world of low heritability, which I'll come back to in a second. So this, what is wrong with this? Well. It's sort of wrong, and I am going to show you, I'm going to show you why it's wrong for two reasons. There are many reasons, but I'm going to focus on two reasons. So the first reason is that population observations are not the same as individual observations. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to start with cholesterol. So for those of you over 40 in the room, which is really just the speakers, um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you, every year you go to your physician and she takes a blood test. She takes your cholesterol. She takes your cholesterol and she says one of two things. Either 
it's okay, or else she says it's high, so take a pill, or don't eat something, or go exercise, or do something like that, right? Now, why does she say that? She says that because she was, she, she was taught to say that in medical school. Why was she taught to say that in medical school? She was taught to say it based on data from the Framingham study. Everybody's heard of Framingham study, big study, important, etc. right? Now, let's look at the Framingham data. So these are, this is Framingham data, and what you have here are two curves. The dark curve are people with heart disease, the dotted curve are people without heart disease. On the x-axis, you have cholesterol. What's the first thing you see when you look at these two curves? You look at the two curves and you say, they are actually almost identical. So if you have a cholesterol over here, you really have no way of knowing whether you're going to be in the heart disease group or not in the heart disease group. So my goodness, why are they teaching you that cholesterol is associated with heart disease? They're lying to you. They're not. They actually are getting that from this exact data. Here's, here's where it's coming from. We are drawing a line. We draw a line. To the right of the line is high cholesterol. To the left of the line is low cholesterol. You can ignore where I'm putting the line, okay? So, we are actually counting the people under the heart disease curve, make them a D. Under the no heart disease curve, make them a C. Um, to the left of the line, same thing. A, B, C, D goes in these squares. B, D is bigger than C, A is bigger than B. A times D is bigger than B times C. I'm sure you all followed that. But AD <laughs> divided by BC is essentially an odds ratio. It is the measure of risk. It underlies all the multiple choice questions you ever get in medical school because that means cholesterol is associated with heart disease in populations. At the individual level, it tells us nothing about whether I am on the dark curve or the dotted curve. Now, you all say, ah, that's just cholesterol. That's old-fashioned. Genes are much cooler. Genes are today. If you have a gene, you'll know which curve you sit on. So this is from a recent paper. It came out, small journal, New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, they showed a uh, genotype score about, this is obesity. It's a great paper. It's a really good paper. Showing higher particular genotype score, the greater your incidence of diabetes. Okay? So look at this. It's a great dose-response relationship. I love this paper because not only do they show you this, they also show you this. Genotype score, diabetes curve, no diabetes curve. There is nothing magical about this. This is simple mathematics. You can reproduce all of this yourself at home. The population observations that tell us about the relative risks of associations between exposure and health indicators tell you essentially next to nothing about individual prediction. These are two separate concepts. Now you're asking, surely you're exaggerating. These are just low risk events, cholesterol, heart disease, genotype score, diabetes, how high does your risk have to be in order to have some individual prediction? In order for me to know if I have a value of X of a particular factor, I have a greater risk of an outcome. How high do you think it has to be? Two, four, six? Well, you can actually model this yourself. You can also do it at home. And here's the answer. This is odds ratio 1.5, 3, 9, 25, 350. When you have an odds ratio of about 350, you actually know if you have a risk factor around here, you will be in the diseased curve. So, Next time you read a paper with an odds ratio of 350, you'll know that that factor is an excellent predictor of whether an individual is going to have a disease. So that's reason one. Now, let me move on to reason two. <laughs> when there's a delayed laugh, it makes the speaker very anxious. Like, what did I do? <laughs> All right. Um, the second reason is that individual observations explain little without understanding context. And I'm going to make this case by discussing obesity. We all know there's obesity rising in the population, and we all know that we've been told, we've been told that it's because we're eating too many Big Macs and not enough carrots, not enough apples, right? And that's true, but this relevant question is, if we intervened only on the junk food eating, if we targeted the individual behavior, are we going to then be able to reduce obesity in populations. How do you address that question? Well, you could argue about it over dinner table, or you could actually model it. So you could model the joint influence of genes, of individual junk food eating, and of environment. And I'm going to show you a modeling exercise. All of this is publicly available. You can all reproduce it yourself. That looks at these three. So here's what you have. Now, this is a, this is a complicated sort of set of uh, pictures, but here's what you read here. On each of these graphs, the x-axis looks at the prevalence of junk food eating. So if you're here, 90% of people are eating junk food. Here, 20%, okay? It's also divided into, into nine squares. 
This here is a sedentary environment. This here is an active environment. This here is a high genetic heritability environment. This here is a low genetic heritability environment. And as I said, I'm focusing on the low genetic heritability environment. Now, what do you see here? Notice that these lines are all flat. If you have a higher prevalence of junk food eating, none of these lines are going up. The risk of obesity in populations is not changing depending on how many people are eating junk food. What is driving the risk, look over here. See how this risk here is higher than this risk, which is higher than that risk? What is driving it is whether you are in an environment that's sedentary or in an environment that's active. Therefore, the risk of obesity among those who eat junk food is driven almost entirely, not by the prevalence of, of junk food eating, but whether environment promotes a sedentary lifestyle. Now, these are risks. There are many of you in the audience who are public health students, so you will say, yeah, you're just talking about risks, but how about population attributable fractions? For those of you in medical school, that is a way of quantifying how much a particular behavior or exposure contributes to disease in population. So what if I change the axis? Let's talk now about how much junk food contributes to the burden of obesity in populations. I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm going to show you that. So here are the same nine curves, and here's what you see. Again, these are all flat. That just because there's more junk food eating, none of these curves are going up. In fact, over here again, in the condition of low heritability, you have higher prevalence of obesity in highly sedentary environment. And the message there is that understanding the prevalence of junk food eating is telling us very little about the contribution of junk food eating to the risk of obesity without also understanding the environment. So two main points I'm making. Populations and individuals are different. That if we say we understand that there's a particular individual factor, be it a gene, be it a behavior, that is associated with a particular health indicator at the population level that is very different than predicting what happens to the individual if the individual has that particular exposure. And secondly, that unless you take into account co-occurring context together with individual factors, we are not going to be successful in predicting health or disease in populations. I'll stop with this. So this is a quote from one of my favorite papers, which says that one of our, one of our major challenges is to ensure that the urgent does not crowd out the important. In health, this challenge is especially difficult because urgent matters can be so riveting. So just to be clear in conclusion, when I have my heart attack, I want a doctor to look after me. I want to be special and I want to be looked after. So none of this is saying anything against the clinical approach or the individual curative approach. What this is saying, though, is that while my health is urgent, and certainly urgent and important to me, it is not important from the point of view of populations. It's that from the point of view of populations, we need to A, make sure that we differentiate from understanding what drives things in populations and what makes for individual prediction. And secondly, you cannot mathematically understand the drivers of the health of population without separating, by separating individual and context, they need to take both into account. And I think that that is a lesson that all of us in biomedicine need to take to heart, as does Mario Balotelli. Thank you very much.